Evening, folks. Um, I would like to sort of just clear things up. I'm not an expert before anybody asks. I'm just somebody who's been very, very interested in the Kennedy family for about 30 or 40 years. And I want to get, talk tonight about four particular incidents in the blood, of the blood feud. Um, but before I do, I want to give you a little bit of background information for some of you who might not know a lot about the family. The Kingdom of Carrick has for centuries traditionally been the heartland home of Scotland's greatest, one of Scotland's greatest historical families, the Kennedys. Although some accounts differ, there's a general consensus that although the Kennedys were present in Carrick from early times, their power was actually advanced when and after they took possession of the Newark Castle. There are differing accounts as to how this happened, with some accounts saying that they were given the castle by the Crown for their support of the King at the, against the Vikings at the Battle of Largs. Other accounts say that in fact there were a Viking unit uh, holding the castle at the time and that the Kennedys drove them out. So we'll have to just wonder what exactly what happened, we'll never know for sure. What we do know is that around 1357, King David of Scotland II confirmed a certain John Kennedy um, in all the lands of South Ayrshire and from that day the name of Kennedy became synonymous with Carrick. The Kennedys prospered and they branched out all over the family areas and with different units and lairdships within Carrick and in fact beyond down into Galloway. They became more and more powerful with many of their number actually reaching very high office at home and abroad. For some examples, James Kennedy of the newer married Princess Mary, the second daughter of King Robert III of Scotland, and their second son, Gilbert became First Lord Kennedy and their third son, James, became Bishop of St Andrews and in fact uh, founded a collegiate college there. Sir Hugh Kennedy of Art Stinchar at Ballantrae played a leading role fighting for Joan of Arc at the relief of the Siege of Orléans in 1429. And in 1562, the last abbot of Crossregal, Abbot Quinton Kennedy debated matters of the religion with John Knox in a house in Maybole. And the house is gone now, but there's still a street in Mabel called John Knox Street. Lady Jane Kennedy, daughter of Gilbert IV Earl of Carrick, who was known as Yin Greedy Man, tied a handkerchief of Carrick lace around the eyes of Mary Queen of Scots at Fotheringay Castle on the morning of her execution. Queen Mary gifted Lady Jane her silver crucifix and chain, and at the back of the crucifix there is a small compartment at one time held a lock of her son James VI hair. It's still in the possession of the Kennedy family to this day. Lady Jane's father that I've mentioned, Gilbert the Fourth Earl, young greedy man as he was known at the time, he was a fascinating character. He had fought for Mary Queen of Scots at the Battle of Langside in 1568, 1568, which she lost and then had to fly to England. Such was his self-esteem, and you might not believe this, he afterwards advised everybody that he had fought for Mary not as a subject, but as an ally, as King of Carrick in Scotland. Thereafter, right up to the current time, the late Seventh Marquis of Ailes has still took great pride in the self styled title of King of Carrick, and his late son Charles the Eighth Marquis and a close friend of mine held a similar belief. The Kennedys were in a sense in law unto, alone to themselves and their history is a fascinating one and it's sometimes a very bloody one. Not only did they fight with surrounding families out with Carrick and beyond but even among themselves the crime of hamesucking, I don't know if any of you have heard of that, it's still in the statute books today but it was known as home sacking and what would happen on a weekend or any night they would raid a neighbour's land stealing stock it was a regular occurrence apparently in Carrick and I still believe, in fact, some would say that nothing's changed in Carrick on a Saturday night today. So a fascinating family. The Kennedys often disagreed on national politics. For example, Sir John Kennedy, 6th Earl of Castles, was a prominent Covenanter who signed the Solemn League and Covenant in 1638 and while in 1655 his relative Archibald Kennedy of Killeen fought the government against the, the, the fought against the Covenant to, uh, for the King, and he took great pleasure, and it's encountered, in actually killing one himself. He shot a man through the back of the head um, while he was chasing him, this guy was trying to escape. So they, they, they followed both sides, 
and he, he did it was this guy was Gilbert McCarran and apparently the Kennedy Lord took great pleasure in shooting him now it became known eventually as Archibald the Wicked of Colleen and it's said that when he died a fiery chariot was seen coming over the sky of Colleen and the devil in it and he was shouting I've come to Colleen for the body and soul of Archibald the Wicked so they're very very famous However, in the 16th century, a great and very bloody feud broke out between the two great Kennedy families in Carrick, the main families. We have the House of Castles on the side of the River Doon, on the banks of the River Doon, and the House of Burgundy on the banks of the River Girvan. The dispute appears to have had several causes, but mainly on two particular matters. Firstly, over which of the houses, either Castles or Burgundy, was in fact the most famous and was the base of the family. In other words, the senior line of the family. And secondly, because Kennedy of Burgundy supported the, uh, the Reformation, while Gilbert IV, Earl of Castle, supported the Catholic cause, they fought on opposite sides at the Battle of Langside with Mary, Queen of Scots. And it caused great annoyance on both sides. As this blood feud progressed through a th more than three or four generations, characters became involved. And it invariably involved other layers in Carrick and Galloway who were forced into supporting one side or the other. There's an old rhyme which says, "Twixt Wigton and the tune of the year, Port Patrick and the crews of Cree, nae man need to think by to bide there, unless he court with Kennedy. In other words, if you weren't with the Kennedy, you were against them, and you might not survive very long. Anyway, in every historical conflict, Machiavellian characters appear. And the Kennedy feud was no exception. On the castle side, Thomas Kennedy of Colleen, who was known as the tutor of castle, castles because he taught the young, the young lord, was the mastermind behind much of the plotting. While on the Burgundy side, the role was taken up by John Muir of Auchendrain, who due his night marauding and murderous actions, the things he did when he wore a long grey riding coat, became known as the grey man of Carrick. However, both of them, both in a moment, we'll hear more, will tell about the foul and bloody deeds they carried out. But let's first of all look at the actual situation ourselves, at the actual characters of the feud. I'm going to mention four tonight. They're all, to me, quite exciting, horrific things, but they did happen in Carrick, remember that. The first one I want to deal with is the roasting of the common data. You'll all know Cross Regal Abbey. Well, at the Reformation, the abbeys were done away with. Now, the layers I had mentioned are rather the Earl of Castles, Gilbert, the fourth Earl. His uncle had been the last abbot. And when the Reformation came about and the lands of the abbey, which were rich lands, came up for sale or for use, he expected to inherit them. As I said, he was a young, greedy man and it was money he wanted. Unfortunately for him, the Privy Council in Edinburgh awarded uh, Cross Regal to a man called Alan Stewart, who was a scholar of national repute and became commendator of Cross Regal Abbey. Now, Gilbert Kennedy was not happy about this at all, and he decided that eh, there was no way he was going to allow this commendator to take over what he rightfully thought were his lands. Now, there are different stories here. We go back to the Burgundy Kennedys now. There is reason to believe that the commendator, this Alan Stewart, was related to Kennedy of Burgundy. Some people say he was, and some historians say he was, and we don't absolutely know for certain. But he had an affiliation with Burgundy rather than Castles. So eventually, um, there are another two stories here. One is that um, Gilbert Kennedy summoned the commendator to discuss the, the lands of the Abbey with him. The other one is that, in fact, he didn't wait that long. The commendator arrived to claim his land at Cross Regal, and one dark night was accosted by Gilbert Kennedy and some armed men in the orchard. He had held a discussion with him and said he wanted to have, to have the land, and there was a big argument followed out, and eventually Kennedy invited him to the New York Castle, he said, to discuss matters further. Um, Will you come for your dinner, he was supposed to have said, and the commentator said, I've already had my dinner, I won't, don't, we don't want to go, to which Kennedy replied, well, you're coming on the horse or over it. So they, they threw him over the horse, but whether he went voluntarily originally to the New York, the New York Castle or he was carried there, which is more likely, he arrived at the New York and there Gilbert Kennedy, the fourth Earl of Castles, had a great ally, a man called Sir William Todd. A serious fighter, a good soldier, but a very cruel and hard man. At 
the same time with him was the master of Castle, Gilbert's brother, younger brother. And they tried to talk um, the commentator into either handing over the lands or in fact, to be fair to Gilbert, he offered them money for the lands of Crossrail. But no matter what he offered him, the commentator was not going to be accommodating and would not offer the lands back either for money or as a gift. So Gilbert Kennedy lost his temper and had William Todd and the rest of some of his side men take him down into what was known as the Black Vault of the Newer, where they stripped him naked and tied him over a frame and roasted him in front of the fire. Now, he was basted while this was going on with oil from his own body. It must have been absolutely horrific. But eventually, every man has got his, he can only suffer so much. And eventually, he was brought back up into the Great Hall. And Gilbert Kenny is supposed to have told Todd, take him down, you have ways of finding out and making him talk. He said, but whatever you do, don't kill him, he has to sign the papers. Well, they brought him up eventually, and eventually, because of what they put him through, the commentator, Alan Stewart, agreed to sign over the Abbey lands to the Earl of Castles. Well, meanwhile, one way or another, Thomas Kennedy, the Laird of Burgundy, found out about this and he was horrified. He was I'm probably a much nicer person than Errol Gilbert. But anyway, he was with his uh, a kinsman called David Kennedy of Maxelton. And he, with Selva and others, by hook or by crook, went to the Newer and actually recovered the abbey, the, uh, recovered the commentator. They, they helped him to escape. One way or another, he escaped out and they took him back to Ayr, and eventually he got back to Edinburgh. It was in a dreadful state. And of course, as was right, he, he made a, a complaint to the Crown. But this is where you see how powerful the Kennedys were. They had so many friends at court, and so much money and everything else. They really got away with things they shouldn't have. And all that happened to Castle was that he was fined £2,000 Scots, but allowed to keep the cross regal lands. So that's the first bloody deed of the feud. Now, that was about mid-16th century, mid to late 16th century, that happened in the 1500s. The next one I want to mention is known as the Tragedy of the Brockloch Burn. Now, it's on the B7024. Those of you who know Carrick will know that there is mid-east and west Brockloch farms, and there's a burn runs down the hill there and right round the area. Not where it would be in these days, but it's known as the Brockloch Burn. Now... <coughs> Gilbert Kennedy, this is the year 1601. It was in the winter when there was a heavy, heavy snowfall and the whole of Carrick was white. Um, Thomas Kennedy of Burgundy, Gilbert Kennedy of Burgundy rather, was in the air doing some business success with some of his supporters and he had decided to ride all the way back to Burgundy that night. Well, this is where the person I talked about earlier, John Muir of Auchendrine, who was one of his staunchest supporters, he tried to talk him out of it. He said, look, he said, you've got to understand that we know um, that your cousin John Kennedy, the new, who is now the fifth Earl of Castles, is determined to put an end to your life. And his uncle, uh, the tutor of Castles, um, Kennedy of um, Colleen, is egging him on and... The spies, are, I've, I've, I have found out from my spies that their spies know that you're going to leave and they're going to waylay you on the road back to Burgundy. Well, whatever else he was, um, Gilbert Kennedy of Burgundy was one of the finest soldiers of his time, a very handsome, apparently good looking young man and a very capable soldier. And he said, look, I'm going about my lawful business. He said, the king will not even allow anybody to stop me. I'm not going to have this. I'm going to Burgundy and if my cousin dares to attack me or to do something, I'll defend myself. Well, despite that all his henchmen um, decided to try and talk him out of it, he wouldn't be. And they left air uh, with approximately 12 mounted layers and 120 foot soldiers. Apparently, John Muir of Auchendrain had talked the air burger bur bur people into lending about 40 hack equipment, 30 or 40 hack equipment. Um, which the hack button, if you don't know what it is, it's a type of a very early musket, very inaccurate. And you have to remember that these men were, were burghers, they were not trained, they were, were not like fighting men like most of the Kennedys were. However, they left here and they headed back towards Maybole, but meanwhile, in uh, the castle at Maybole, were old friend, the, the man, the, the, the Machiavellian character, Kennedy, the tutor of castles, he was determined to get his young protege, um, John Kennedy, the new Earl, to waylay his cousin and kill him. He said, it's the only way we'll put an end to this feud. He's got to be killed. 
Well, initially, I have to say that from my reading of it and the stories I've heard and the reading I've done, um, John Kennedy, the Earl of Castle, was not in favour of this. He said, this will cause, we're not going to wait with it. Even the king, he'll eventually do something if, we, if he kills somebody of our Guinness standing. But one way, one thing led to another, and Thomas Kennedy of Colleen eventually talked his protégé into going ahead with attacking Kennedy of Burgundy on the way home. Well, they left Mabel Castle with quite a heavy uh, armed allegiance, and they arrived in the hill at the top of the Brockbuck Burn. We're not just exactly sure where the battle took place, but it was in the middle of a snowstorm. Um, the Burgundy Kennedys, with their, their adherents, came marching up up the hill towards the thing and realised they were going to be ambushed at the top. And the battle started with a few hackbutt shots, with not too much damage, we'll have to say, to anybody. But eventually, young Kennedy from Burgundy had had enough. He drew his sword and ordered his men to charge his cousin's men at the top of the hill. They rode right up the hill into them, and a massive fight began at the top of the hill. Now, during that, Kennedy of Greenan, who was one of uh, the castle supporters, um, young Burgundy killed him with a cut to his neck, nearly cut his head off with the sword, apparently, and he fell from his horse. On his side, on the other side, on Burgundy's side, New of Open Drain received, he killed, I think, two or three Kennedy retainers, and then he was stabbed in the thigh and fell from his horse. Another sad person was um, a guy called Robert Crawford, who was, in fact, Burgundy's steward, um, and he was killed as well. And Gilbert Kennedy of Burgundy killed a few more, but suddenly... In the middle of the melee, as happened in these days, with everybody fighting one another, someone appeared behind the Kennedy of Burgundy, and it was a man called John Dick who had a lance. And he, it's, the sad thing is that he had been a former retainer of Burgundy's and turned traitor and joined the Earl of Castles. And he rode up behind young Burgundy and stabbed him in the neck from the back, with right through the gorget, with a lance. And he fell from his horse. Eventually, the fight finished... The Earl of Castles had realised that Burgundy was down, thought the work was done, and the fight broke off. Well, the wounded, the dying were picked up and the wounded were taken back to air, especially Gilbert Kennedy of Burgundy. And about two or three days later, the, later, the accounts differ, he died in air from his wounds. Well, such the times were so dreadful. He was taken eventually, his body was taken back to Burgundy and eventually laid to rest in um, Ballantrae in the Kennedy Hall in the graveyard at Ballantrae and he lies there today, some say, in his full armour. His lady eventually joined him there and apparently on the day of the funeral there were between two and three thousand mounted layers and knights from all over Scotland attended the funeral. The strange thing is that Kennedy of Colleen, who organised the whole fight and, and, and the, the ambush, um, was right. The king didn't bother. Nobody seems to have done anything about it. It just appears to have been a fight between the Kennedys. End of story. Although it became known as the tragedy of the Brockbog Burn. Because as I say, young Kennedy of Burgundy was a fine young man and greatly respected by everybody. Now, the next item of the feud involves the famous John Muir of Auchendrain again. The grey man. His wound eventually healed, but he was lame apparently for the rest of his life. And he was determined to gain revenge for the loss of his friend, young Kennedy of Burgundy. As was, in fact, Kennedy's brother, who now became the new laird of Burgundy, Thomas Kennedy, known as the Wolf of Dramorchie. Well, Muir plotted for a long time, and eventually he gathered them all in Auchendrain House or Castle, as it was then, on the banks of the Dune. And they discussed the matter, and he produced a plan. Now, the internecine rivalry and things of the Kennedys is a strange thing, because Thomas Kennedy of the Tutor of Castles at Colleen was a very clever man. And strangely enough, his daughter was married to John Muir of Auchendrain's son. So it showed you how families were split. And he seemed to have quite kind intentions to people, because he sent a young man um, called John Dalrymple, a young messenger, from Colleen to Auchendrain to say that I'm leaving Green and Castle on such and such a morning to go to up to uh, Edinburgh because I have business to attend to. Can I be doing any business for you while I'm there? So this was obviously your chance to get revenge. So he called a meeting, as I said, at um, in his castle, and he called in Walter Muir of Clancaird, 
Thomas Kennedy of Bergeny, the new, the new um, alert, the Wolf of the Murchie, a guy called Thomas McAlexander, who was a staunch Bergeny supporter, another Bergeny supporter, Thomas Wallace, and a borderer called William Irvin. And the plot was that they would waylay Kennedy of Killeen on his route to Edinburgh and murder him. Now, initially, I have to say that all the reading and all the, all the, le- the feedback I've had, I've had is that, to be fair, the Wolf of Dramurchie, young Thomas Kennedy, who had now taken on the role of the leader of Burgundy, he was not in favour of this. He thought, well, then, this is pure, pure murder. It's not even a fight, it's murder. We'll get into so much trouble over this. But Muir of Auchendrain was a very, very convincing man. And eventually, he convinced them all that this, would have, this deed would have to be done. So they knew exactly when um, Colleen would leave Green Castle. And he headed towards the air and he went through what was known then as the Wood of St. Leonard's. Now, if you all know St. Leonard's Church in here, the church is in that area. The Wood of St. Leonard's covered that area of the town. And as they went through the Woods of St. Leonard's, these people were waiting for him. Thomas Kennedy of Burgundy, Walter Muir of Clancaird, Thomas McAlexander, Thomas Wallace, and the borderer called William Irvin. They lay in the bushes within the woods for quite a while till they heard the hoofbeats coming through, and along came Kennedy of Killeen with a young squire, um, Lancelot Kennedy, who was squire to him. And the old man was in the lead with the squire behind him when they all attacked him. And the first thing that happened was apparently um, Thomas Kennedy of Burgundy cut him across the neck with his sword. Somebody else shot him in the chest with a, a, a dagger, a pistol as it was known. He received another thrust through the middle from one of the other ones with a sword. Nobody's sure exactly which one. And finally, we, we believe, or I've read to believe, that it was this William Irvin. As the old man lay dying on the ground, he stuck a, a spear right through his back, through the spine, to finish him off. And then he told the rest to fly for their lives, and he would finish the old man off, much sicker, as they said in Scotland, with a, da- a dagger. As for the young squire, of course, he had immediately turned, turned his horse round and headed back to Greenan. And of course, the, the, the murderers were petrified that Kennedy of Greenan and some of the other Kennedys would mount an attack and chase them, which didn't actually happen. But they had to fly the country, and two or three of them had to take a uh, fly to safety in France for some time because there was a public outcry and they were put to the horn, as it was said, by the king. Although, again, nothing happened to any of them. And that was the sad end of Thomas Kennedy of Colleen, the tutor of castles. So he got his come up in his own way because it wasn't any better than any of the rest of them. As, of course, did John Muir of Auchendrain. And I'm going to waylay here just a wee bit to fill you in as to what his, his end was. You'll remember that I said um, that Colleen had sent a young messenger, John Joel Rimple, with the information that he was going to travel to Edinburgh. Now, John Muir was a very um, savvy person, and he realised that the only way that the murderers could know when he was coming and where he was going was through the information young Del Rimple had passed. And he, was, he, he thought if, if Del Rimple get, gets caught and questioned, he's going to tell them, and I'll be in trouble too. So what he did was he actually arranged later on to have young Del Rimple seized and sent to the Isle of Arran, where he was kept semi-prisoner for a while, but he escaped. And he came back to air, and he was found at one time later by Muir supporters and sent again, this time to Belgium, to the wars in France, where nobody really came back because of quite vicious times. But unfortunately for young Del Rimple, he came back, and Muir and his colleagues caught him at Givenmain's farm, and they shot him and killed him and buried him in the sand. The body was washed up later. It's a, it's a great story. I'm just going to be very brief with it. The body was washed up later, and eventually Muir was caught, and he and his son were actually taken to Edinburgh, tried and executed for the murder of young Del Rimple. So both the Machiavellian characters in this part of the feud both got their comeuppance, so to speak. So the Kennedys of Virginia um, had further revenge on the castle's faction later on. And this is another story which is, is very important, but we're not going to tell it tonight, it would take too long. Because apparently the Countess of Castles and the Earl's brother, um, the master, and some of their men were travelling, I believe, to them fleece, and they headed through and they got chased by the Burgundy faction, got word of them, chased them, and they were trapped in Auchinsoo Farm at Bar. The Burgundy Kennedys burned the building, 
and captured the Countess and the young uh, master of castles and took them prisoners to Burgundy. That's another tale, but that's one for another one, another night. Now, the final actual bloody tale of the Kennedys that I want to tell tonight is the next one, is known as the Death of the Master of Stair. Now, I'm going to show you a wee book here. I don't know if you can see it. I wrote this book oh, a few number of years ago, The Blood Feed of the Kennedys, and all these stories are in it. There it's there. It's out of print now, but it has a foreword from the Marquis of Ailsa, um, Lord Charles Kennedy, 8th Marquis of Ailsa, and 19th Earl of Castles. And we put this booklet together. A lot of it had went to America, um, where they are very, very interested in the Kennedy um, faction. Anyway, the death of the Master of Steer is one of the final stories in that. Now, you're going to probably think the Master of Steer, that's down at Stonrar. Well, remember what I said, the Kennedys had a lot of um, control in, in, down into Fish and Galloway. And for some reason, it's not all 100% clear. There's a rumple um, of uh, Steer were great supporters of the Burgundy Kennedys. And in fact, Thomas Dalrymple, the young master of Steyr, had actually taken part in the Battle of the Brocklock Burn on Burgundy's side, and he had also apparently been involved in the burning of Auchinsoo Farm and the taking of the prisoners to Burgundy, as I mentioned earlier. So what, what, what happened then? Well, he went, was going to Burgundy because he had heard, he really knew that the, the, the Countess had been captured. And not only, not only, um, not only the Countess, but the Master of Steer was kept prisoner at Burgundy. And the, he knew that the new Laird of Burgundy, the Wolf of Demurchie, young Burgundy's brother, who was now the Laird, was a, a different person altogether from his, his brother, and would very possibly maybe be capable of murdering the Countess of Castle and the Master. And the Lintel knew that this would cause all sorts of havoc. So he was heading to Burgundy to speak with Burgundy and try and talk him into returning the Countess. Etc. Well, he stayed on his way from Stranraer. He stayed overnight in Arstonshire Castle at Ballantrae. Now, Arstonshire Castle is a fascinating place. It was a, uh, it was held by the Burgundy side of the Kennedy family, and Thomas Dalrymple stayed there overnight before he headed for Burgundy. Now, he had with him at that time a young, what he was known as a sergeant at arms or a squire, and um, called Walter McCulloch. And Walter McCulloch, they had two horses with them. Um, the Master of Stair had a, a black charger, which was a bit spent. It was an old horse, but he loved the horse and he wouldn't ride the other one. He had a new one, this grey, which was much faster. Uh, but that was being ridden by Walter McCulloch. So they're going to leave our Stinger Castle. Um, they were going to, to, to leave our Stinger Castle and head for Burgundy. And McCulloch apparently had pleaded with the master of stair, he said, let's go by the coast. He says, it's safer. If we have to, if we've got to the Stinchar Valley, he said, Craig Neal is now occupied by the Erla Castles. And he says, sure as good as we could end up in trouble. But of course, the master of stair, nobody in, uh, interferes with me. I'm the master of stair. I'll do what I want. It's quicker to go by the Stinchar Valley. And that's what they did. Well, they're riding up the Stinchar Valley on apparently quite a good day um, and talking and quite happy, etc. And they were passing near Craig Neal Castle. Um, when suddenly out of the woods round about them appeared, were well, reckoned between 30 and 40 castles horsemen, heavily armoured. And would you believe who led them? John Dick, the man who had killed young Burgundy at the Brocklock Burn and had turned traitor. He had already been a Burgundy man, but he was now firmly in place with the Earl of Castles. Well, when they saw young um, Steyr, they knew who he was and they decided they would have him because they knew he had been involved in the feuds, etc. And they chased him and his young squire, his master at arms, him and McCulloch, right along the Stincher Valley. And of course, inevitably, um, the master of Steer's horse, the old black one, began to get exhausted, very tired, began to falter. And the uh, castle's faction began to catch up on them, with John Dick leading them in the front. Well, young McCulloch pleaded with the master of Steer, he says, look, take, switch, switch horses, you take the grey, it's faster, you've a chance of getting away, I'll, I'll take the black and take my chances. However, the master of Steer, being a very honourable man, said, under no circumstances, I'm keeping my black horse, you get in the grey, ride to Burgundy, tell them what's happened, get in touch with my father, the Earl of Steer, um, or Lord Steer, or whoever he was at that time, and they'll come to my rescue. So that's what happened. Young McCulloch, very 
sporting like a fly. I didn't want to go, but he rode away and left left the Master of Steer riding ahead of the Burgundy faction, uh, the, the, the Castles faction. Well, John Dick led his men and they, got, they caught up and caught up, and eventually the Master of Steer drew a pistol from his holster, turned around just as John Dick caught up with him and shot John Dick right through the forehead, and he fell to the ground dead, as a, a dodo, as we would say, and the other horseman had to ride over the top of him. So that was the end of John Dick. Another uh, rather wicked man, not a nice person, who got his comeuppance in the Kennedy feud. But unfortunately, um, Steer's horse faltered, and he fell to the ground. The horse, horse fell, and he went with it. And before he knew where he was, he was surrounded by a whole lot of the castle's men, soldiers who dismounted. And one of them, according to one of the stories, as he had pulled the dirt and was going to cut the Master of Steer's throat, when who should appear himself but John Kennedy, the fifth Earl of Castles. Now, whatever else he might be, he wasn't just going to have this man killed out. He wanted revenge. He knew how much Steer had supported the Kennedys of Burgundy, so he took him to Craig New Castle and questioned him. And he said to him, look, he said, I've had enough of this. He said, you're going to pay the penalty for all of this. He said, if you do not drop your fealty to Burgundy and swear fealty to me, he said, then I'm going to, I'm going to try him. Now, it wasn't a fair trial. He tried him in the Great Hall at Craig New, and of course it was a one-sided affair. He found him guilty and sentenced to be hanged from the yet of Craig New, the entrance to the castle. And he said to him, now, if you swear fealty and abjure your sins, I might still save you. To which, to be for his credit, Steer said, no, I'm a Burgundy man, you're an evil man, he said, I've got no time for you. He said, as far as I'm concerned, he says, you'll end up no better than me. Um, and he wouldn't be convinced, and he took the, the oath of Virginia to Virginia uh, instead of castles, and he was hanged from the yet of Craig Neal Castle. And you can go down to Central Valley today and see the ruin of Craig Neal Castle. So that was the end of him, and that was the end of some of the, 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 the bloody business of the, the, the feud. But there are many, many other stories. You would not believe the number there are. You could write half a dozen books, and hopefully I'm, I'm going to try and follow them all up eventually. But we we'll have to limit ourselves tonight to what we can tell you, and it can be too much information. So let's, for a moment now, before we sort of wind down, look at the Kennedys today. What is the situation today? Because they were a very famous family. They owned at one time almost every um, great house and building in, in Carrick. Um, I mean, some of some of the properties are, are there today and others are not. Um, in fact, if you look uh, carefully at it, I'm just trying to look here. You had you had um, Burgundy, you had Craig Neal, you had Castles, you had Denure, you had um, Greenham Castle, nearly and you had uh, all over Carrick. There, and when, when we look at property, somebody was a layer of a property. It wasn't always a castle. If you look at some of the farms in Carrick, the older farms they were built in a square for defence. The, the house, the main house would be inside and there'd be a curtain wall around the whole lot. So many of these um, houses were, that were there um, were part, belonged to Kennedys. Um, I think I mentioned some of them. The leadership for us, again, we've got Castle of Colleen, Craig Neal, Denure, Art Center at Ballantree, Burgundy, Knockdaw, and Benin are just a few of them. I want to go back to Burgundy or Center for a minute or two because it's a well known castle. and. A book the, called The Grey Man about John Muir um, was, was written, and it's a very old book, and it's a great story about the Kennedys, but um, there's two mistakes in it, and it was written by the man who wrote it. He said in, in the beginning that Arstinger Castle was burned to the ground by the Earl of Castles. It wasn't. It fell into disuse. And the second myth is the tale of Sonny Bean the cannibal. Sonny Bean never really existed, but people still think he did. So these are two myths in the grey mine. So let's now move to the Kennedys of the day. Through my interest in Carrick and Kennedy family history, I was very fortunate to meet work and work with and become a very close friend of the late Lord Charles Kennedy, Marquis of Ailsa and 19th Earl of Castles. In addition, in my day-to-day -day work when I was an environmental health officer in Carrick, and my involvement with Carrick 800 Battle Reenactment Society led me to meet his brother, Lord David, who is now the 9th Marquis of Ailsa and 20th Earl of Castles. And again, in turn, with his son, Lord Archie Kennedy, who is greatly interested and very knowledgeable about his incredible family history. 
The late Lord Charles was a staunch supporter of the Kennedy Society of North America, which in fact has its own sub and many members who support every clan gathering in the United States every year. Lord Charles used to organise Kennedy tours of Scotland and Ireland, and I was on up to assist him in these tours, both as a guide and as a his historian. As a result, I'm still in touch with society and indeed an honorary member of that society, and I've been able to help many of the members with family research, on which the Americans, as you'll know, are very, very keen. They produce an excellent quarterly Club My Clan magazine, to which I contribute, and Lord David provides a family update in every issue. To me, it's incredible and exciting that the Kennedy family have retained their long and event, um, eventual, event, eventual, eventual history, I think I'm trying to say, and are still, are still strongly represented and held in very high esteem, both at home and abroad. Currently, Lord David has developed castles in Killeen Estate with environmental management standards set so high as to have achieved national recognition. Now, one other thing I think I would like to mention to you, um, they're a great family, but we must remember, I've had this discussion with a lot of different people over the years about the clan system in Scotland. And the Kennedys, Lord Charles and I used to discuss this regularly because he was a great believer in the Clan Kennedy, and they call it the Clan Kennedy Society in America. And I used to keep saying to him, you are not a clan, you are a family, a lone family. And he would say to me, but we've got a tartan. And I said, yes, you have a tartan. You know why you've got a tartan? I said, because in the Victorian times, um, when Sir Walter Scott started his carry-on, he decided everybody in Scotland should have a tartan, not just the Highland families. In, in, the, in the Highlands, a clan is a family. And the difference between them and the Kennedys, and I said to Lord Charles and to Lord David, a wonderful family, a fantastic collection, but they were never over the Highland line in their life. They are a very, very important ruling family. But every country, every family in Scotland now has got a tartan, so good luck to them. Well, tonight, we've only really glanced at some of the history of the Kennedys. There are still dozens and dozens of fascinating facts and stories still to be told. All I can say now is that I hope you've enjoyed our chat and maybe even been encouraged to follow up your own history and tales of the Kingdom of Carrick. We live in one of the most exciting parts of Scotland with a fantastic history. It broke away from Galloway in 1186 um, under the MacDowell family and has never stopped being important since. And to this day, as you come into Carrick, you'll still see a sign saying, Welcome to Carrick. Thank you all very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if the ladies...